Hello, and welcome everybody to this week's V3 with your host, Gretchen Ledford. Today we are going to be following up on an article that was in Issue 4, Volume 67 of the Blue Banner, out this week, where managing editor Larissa Carr explored a topic of refugees in North Carolina. She joins us here today to talk about what she discovered. Welcome, Larissa. Thank you so much, Gretchen. So, with the constant revision to the travel ban, it appears that America is becoming more fearful of refugees. Mm -hmm. Have refugees always been treated this way? Yeah, actually. I was surprised to find out I interviewed a professor at UNCA who teaches a class on immigration law and refugee law, and um, he told this really interesting anecdote. It wasn't an anecdote, actually. It was a it was definitely a story about a Chinese immigrant named Che Chanping. And he lived in San Francisco in the 18, I think it was late 1800s. And he went home to China um, just to visit his family, um, whatever. And he came back to the States, but he found out that during the time that he was in China, the United States had enacted a travel ban against Chinese immigrants. So even though he had been living in San Francisco for, like, I don't think it was, like, 30 years, but it was definitely, like, 20 years or, like, a decade or two, he was prevented from coming back into the country. Um, That sounds eerily familiar. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, so what happened was um, I was talking to this professor, and he was saying how the United States has never been particularly friendly to refugees. People associate it as a country that's, you know, like built on immigration, like um, they use the term melting pot a lot and whatever. But yeah, he was saying how they're not particularly friendly to them. And while they haven't had a policy of being hostile to them until, you know, now, um, there's been kind of like an avoidant, you know, kind of an underlying fear of refugees, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah, I find that really interesting. And I think it also points to an interesting difference when we talk about refugees in terminology. Mm. So you just mentioned immigrants, um, and then there are refugees, and there are asylum seekers. What makes a refugee a refugee? Okay, so um, a refugee has to be fleeing persecution of some sort. A refugee, there's five definitions. Race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group, or a political opinion. Those are the five categories that uh, refugees fall into. The professor of refugee and immigration law and policy also pointed out that there were categories that the U.S. does not recognize of refugees, specifically economic or environmental refugees, which is really interesting. So, yeah, um, in particular, an immigrant is someone who has come into the country and um, necessarily isn't fleeing like persecution. A lot of immigrants are primarily coming from Latin and South America. And once they are labeled as a refugee, mm-hmm. are they given certain protections, or what does the government then do with that label? The government has a really extensive vetting process, and that's something that, you know, like, that's one of sort of the misconceptions people have right now. Um, Trump is making it out through his rhetoric He's giving people the impression that people who are, you know, like in Syria, who are essentially fleeing, like, you know, a mass genocide practically, he's giving the impression that they can just hop on a plane and come here and, I guess, uh, just hop into society, really. Mm -hmm. And that's a misconception. There's the Homeland Security, the Department of Homeland Security has a very extensive vetting process that they go through, and it takes... I think it takes months, and um, yeah, once they get here, um, they're, they usually go, there are nine government agencies that are funded, I think, by the Department of State, and a lot of them are Catholic or Episcopal or Lutheran, and they're usually put in one of these agencies, and these agencies help resettle them, and initially they're given classes in English, They're um, given opportunities or told what different job opportunities are. And they're slowly, over a process of several months, they're slowly helped to sort of get used to acclimate to society here. So initially it starts out, 
kind of like a hand-holding thing. Like, you're new in the country, you're a refugee, here's your community of fellow refugees. And a lot of refugees, for instance, I was surprised to find out that um, the highest refugee population in North Carolina is are from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which um, Gibney described as being the most uh, violent country in the world, which I have volunteered at refugee organizations before and met some people from the Congo and, like, just heard, you know, a little bit about their stories. And it, it it's pretty intense in the Congo. So, yeah, they're, they're usually, in North Carolina in particular, they're relocated to a hub. Like, Asheville is not particularly well-known for refugees mm-hmm. because it's kind of, you know, removed from the center. But Raleigh, Charlotte... Um, They have big refugee populations there because they're more, you know, like typical skyscraper type of, not skyscraper, but, you know, like they're more like... Bigger cities, Bigger cities. Yeah, 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 exactly. So once they're brought here, um, they usually stick to the area where they're brought. And um, one of the really interesting things that I found out um, from Dr. Gibney was talking about what characterizes U.S refugee policy from other countries in the world. Mm -hmm. And he was saying how U.S. refugee policy has a lot to do with family. Like, if you have a family member here, then you're more likely to be accepted as a refugee, Mm. Um, which I thought was really interesting. And usually, because people who are refugees, when they come into the city, if they have had family members, they usually come to that specific city because of that family member and um, they usually stay there. Gibney pointed out how it's very rare for someone, a refugee who comes into Charlotte or Raleigh or you know another major city hub to relocate to a rural area. Usually they have a community there, they have family members there and that's where they stick. So the US, they really place a big emphasis on family which I thought was interesting. Yeah, I find that really interesting. And it does make a great deal of sense when you're coming into an area where you don't speak the language and mm-hmm. you're you know, not used to the culture to stick around people who understand you and understand your cultural values. You know? Yeah. So that, that definitely makes a great deal of sense. And I think it might be surprising for some that North Carolina is actually one of the states that has welcomed quite large numbers of refugees Mm -hmm. in comparison to others. Uh, You interviewed Scott Phillips, who is the director for the Raleigh office, the U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants, and he said it's one of the top states. Is Mm -hmm. that correct? Yeah, I think it's number seven, if I'm not mistaken. That's awesome. Uh, What have you found out about these refugees other than where they're centralized? You mentioned that most of them are coming from the Democratic Congo. Where Mm -hmm. else are they coming from? Um, They're coming from Somalia. They're coming from Iraq. They're coming from Syria. Um, Asheville surprisingly has a really big Ukrainian and Russian uh, refugee population, which my family um, were Ukrainian refugees, three of my four grandparents. So that that's really interesting that they get relocated here. And yeah, primarily Middle Eastern countries, African countries. There are some, back in the day, there was a population, I think from Burma, and now you're starting to see a a really large-scale persecution of a group of people in Burma called the Rohingya, Mm -hmm. who are Muslims, and they're being persecuted, driven out into refugee camps in Bangladesh and neighboring countries. The Department of Homeland Security has issued a a statement saying that they stand with the Rohingya, and this is very much a fresh topic, so I predict we're going to see, at least for North Carolina, now that the refugee population is set to be slashed in half thanks to Trump and the recent declaration that he put out there the other day. I do predict that some of the refugees that are going to be allowed to come in might be or are likely to be from Burma. So, so sorry, I, I want to butt in there for a second the, yeah. that uh, the North Carolina refugees are being slashed in half. Is that correct? The whole country. The whole country, half the amount of refugees. And we were already on the lower end of the spectrum yes. from taking in refugees. Yes, in even compared scale. to Bush and Reagan. Yeah. Um, surprisingly, Obama really, he talked about increasing the refugee population. I think he did increase it to 110,000, which was a pretty significant number considering past refugee populations that have been let in. And Trump, um, I think Rex Tillerson 
said that the refugee population would go to 50,000, if not less. And then he just announced the other day that the refugee population was going to be cut in half. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Why do you think it is important that the United States continues to welcome refugees? Like, why is it important that we're having these people come in? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I think it's important um, because there was recently a study by the Department of Health and Human Services, and this is maybe, this isn't the only reason why, I think, but it showed that refugees have contributed billions of dollars to the economy. They're earnest. They're earnest to learn the language. They're earnest to assimilate into the culture. Um, They're earnest to participate in the society of the United States. They're very thankful to be here. They're very appreciative of the fact that they're no longer in a camp. The average refugee stays in a camp for 17 years. And only, I think it's something like 1% of the world, of displaced people in the world, will be resettled. And yeah, they're grateful that they're no longer in a camp. As you mentioned, I talked to Scott Phillips, and he was saying how he overheard some people from the Democratic Republic of the Congo uh, not too long ago in North Carolina say, y'all which he found to be really cool. He was like, wow, like these people come from a completely different culture and this is a very specific expression uh, located to the area and they're incorporating that into their everyday language. And I think it's really evident that they want to learn English, they want to be a part of society and they're grateful. And I think, you know, like while there are problems, if you research the history of the United States, you know, like the practical you know, genocide of Native Americans and just the whole concept of manifest destiny and all that, like while there are problems of with the founding of the United States and what it's based on, if you look at it in the past, it's traditionally been acknowledged as a nation of immigrants and, you know, welcoming to people from different backgrounds. And I think if anything that characterizes the U.S., that'll make us A progressive country, I think that is what makes the United States different from other countries and what could continue to make it different from other countries. So, yeah, I think allowing refugees, they're a tremendous boon to the economy. Um, They're earnest. They're grateful. They're... They're people. Yeah, they're people. And that that was one of um, the things that Scott Phillips said. He said people who look at refugees, they think in terms of numbers, and you said, these aren't numbers that you're dealing with. These are lives. And I think that's that's a really important perspective to keep in mind. These are lives. These are people with hopes, dreams, aspirations. They've, you know, sort of been hindered from living maybe their life to the fullest by being in a camp for 17 years, which is, to me, unfathomable growing up in the United States. So, yeah, yeah that's why I think refugees are really important to let in. Yeah. And you're going to be continuing this line of research for the next couple of months, is that correct? That's correct. That's awesome. What are some of the other topics that you're going to be looking into during those months? I'm going to be looking at the vetting process. So it's definitely going to be learning the difference between asylum and refugee, uh, asylum seeker and refugee, um, and what characterizes those two specific terms. Um, And just looking at the vetting process, how extensive it is, interviewing different refugee communities. I'm hoping to reach out to the community from the Democratic Republic of the Congo, reach out to the Russian refugee community here. While the next couple articles that I'm writing are going to deal with numbers specifically and documents, um, I'd really like to veer, I think the last couple articles, I'd like to veer more into like a profile territory and actually hear stories from people. It's It's difficult to interview refugees because a lot of them are very introverted. Um, A lot of them have fled war zones and are traumatized, and a lot of them, like, are still learning the language. And when you're learning language in a new country, it's, you know, there's a lot of timidity and a lot of self-consciousness. I haven't gotten the opportunity to actually talk to any refugees yet, but that's really after I focus on documents in the process and, you know, just um, the United States history of letting in immigrants and refugees and asylum seekers, I'd really like to find some people with uh, testimonies of being in these specific countries. Yeah. 
Well, we really look forward to the upcoming articles and hearing those interviews hopefully in the future and having you back on this podcast. But I appreciate that you took the time today to kind of explain the situation as it stands here in North Carolina. So thank you. Absolutely, Gretchen. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And that's all for today.